Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio from Monday, August 26, 2024. On this third anniversary of the bombing at Abbey Gate outside Kabul's Hamid Karzai International Airport in Afghanistan, former President Donald Trump, Republican presidential nominee, visits Arlington National Cemetery to lay wreaths in honor of the fallen and then speaks to the National Guard Association Conference in Detroit. He posts online that that day was the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country and Kamala's and Biden's incompetence left 13 dead warriors, hundreds of civilians killed and grievously wounded. Vice President Kamala Harris, Democratic presidential nominee, says in a statement, these 13 devoted patriots represent the best of America, putting our beloved nation and their fellow Americans above themselves and deploying into danger to keep their fellow citizens safe. She also writes, President Biden made the courageous and right decision to end America's longest war. U.S. House Bipartisan Task Force investigating the Donald Trump assassination attempt visits the rally site where it happened in Butler, Pennsylvania. Donald Trump suggests he may not participate in the presidential debate on September 10th, hosted by ABC News, because he says the network is biased against him. And Kamala Harris wants to keep the microphones on the entire time. White House National Security spokesperson John Kirby gives an update on the military exchange over the weekend between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon and the ongoing Israel-Hamas ceasefire talks. And White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan stops in Canada on his way to China. Story from News Nation, former President Donald Trump is tying Vice President Kamala Harris to the withdrawal from the Afghanistan war on the third anniversary of the suicide bombing that killed 13 U.S. service members in Kabul. Monday marks three years since the August 26, 2021 suicide bombing at Hamid Karzai International Airport, which killed 13 American service members and more than 100 Afghans. The Islamic State group claimed responsibility for the attack. Donald Trump honored the fallen service members killed in the bombing by laying a wreath at Arlington National Cemetery, joined by some of the families at the tomb of the unknown soldier. That was from News Nation. And taps was played after Donald Trump laid that wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown by his side, Marine Corporal Kelsey Lenard, who was paralyzed during the bombing at Abbey Gate three years ago. Former President Trump then traveled to Detroit, Michigan to speak at the National Guard Association. He spoke about the anniversary. He references former Congresswoman and presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard, Democrat of Hawaii, who spoke before him and endorsed him for president. Tulsi mentioned early this morning, Tulsi and I were at Arlington National Cemetery with the families of service members who lost their lives in the catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan. Not that we withdrew, but the way they did it. We were going to do it with dignity and strength. We were in the process of getting out. We would have never given up Bagram, one of the biggest air bases in the world, one hour away from where China makes its nuclear weapons. We gave it up. We gave it. We gave them everything. China took it over. China now occupies it. Can you imagine? The longest, most powerful runways, I think, eight feet of concrete down. And we gave it all up. Spent billions and billions of dollars years ago building it. One hour away. And we're gone. And now China occupies it. Today marks the three-year anniversary of the terrorist attack at Abbey, Abbey Gate. Now, we say Abbey Gate. A lot of people don't know what that means. It means Afghanistan that left 13 American service members dead, dozens more badly wounded, and many innocent civilians also killed and injured. Hundreds of people killed. Never been anything like it. It's the wrong base. Shouldn't have taken the soldiers out first. Should have taken the soldiers out last. That's where you'd want to be. They took the soldiers out first, and they had a field day at our expense and our reputation. We will never forget those brave warriors who made the supreme sacrifice for our country. They will live in our hearts forever. And to all the Gold Star families, our gratitude is everlasting, will be everlasting always. We will honor their memory by restoring a government that puts the American people first caused by Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, the humiliation in Afghanistan set off the collapse of American credibility and respect all around the world. 
And the fake news doesn't want to talk about it. They don't even talk about the three-year anniversary. Her terrible word to use, but that's what they're calling it, an anniversary. It's really — I think of anniversary as a little bit different, but it's three years now. And the fake news doesn't even talk about it. Our country will never be safe again until we have fired those responsible for this disaster. Nobody fired. Worst, most embarrassing — in my opinion, the most embarrassing day in the history of our country. It gave us Russia going into Ukraine. It gave us the October 7th attack on Israel, because it gave us lack of respect. We're not respected. We were respected very much four years ago. We're not respected now. Former President Donald Trump, Republican presidential nominee at the National Guard Association annual conference in Detroit. WPBN Traverse City, Michigan reports that more than 4,000 Guard officers, spouses, and other guests are registered to attend. That the association has hosted at least one major party candidate in every presidential election since 1992. And the association also invited Vice President Kamala Harris, the Democratic nominee for president, to speak. Both President Joe Biden and Vice President Harris with written statements on this anniversary of the Kabul bombing from Vice President Harris. Today and every day, I mourn and honor them. My prayers are with their families and loved ones. My heart breaks for their pain and their loss. These 13 devoted patriots represent the best of America, putting our beloved nation and their fellow Americans above themselves and deploying into danger to keep their fellow citizens safe. As I have said, President Biden made the courageous and right decision to end America's longest war. Over the past three years, our administration has demonstrated we can still eliminate terrorists, including the leaders of al-Qaeda and ISIS, without troops deployed into combat zones. I will never hesitate to take whatever action necessary to counter terrorist threats and protect the American people and the homeland. That was the statement from Vice President Kamala Harris. Both the president's statement and the vice president's statement included the names of the 13 Americans who were killed. John Kirby, White House National Security Communications Advisor, spoke about the anniversary at the open of a virtual audio news conference. Today marks three years since the devastating terrorist attack at Abbey Gate outside of uh, Kabul International Airport, an attack that killed 13 American service members and uh, and more than 100 innocent Afghans. Of course, it wounded many more. In statements released this morning, the president and the vice president honored the 13 American heroes who were taken from us on that day. Their prayers and all of our prayers have been and will continue to be with the members' families uh, and their loved ones and their colleagues uh, in the military. Uh, and those prayers will stay with them every day and have stayed with them every day since that terrible attack. As our statements said this morning, these 13 Americans and those who were wounded were patriots in every sense, in the highest sense. They embodied the very best of who we are as a country, brave, committed, selfless. And we owe them and their families a sacred debt that we'll never really be able to fully repay, but that we can never stop trying to do so. Today, our longest war is over. But our commitment to preventing attacks on the homeland and on our people will never be. We'll continue to disrupt terrorist activity wherever we find it, continue to deliver justice to terrorists who plot against America, just as we have over the last three years with leaders from al-Qaeda and ISIS. And we'll also be able to do all that without having to deploy thousands of American troops to ground wars overseas. So again, as we mark this solemn day, uh, we also honor all those who served and sacrificed and for the families who likewise served and sacrificed. John Kirby is White House National Security Communications Advisor, part of an audio online news conference. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin putting out a written statement on this anniversary that reads in part, we will never forget these 13 brave Americans, 11 Marines, a soldier and a sailor who lost their lives defending their teammates and helping to save tens of thousands of Afghans seeking freedom and the opportunity for a better life. Members of the U.S. House Task Force looking into the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump were on the site of the shooting today, Butler Farm Showgrounds in Butler, Pennsylvania, from KDKA. They write, following the U.S. Secret Service's investigation, 
Into the attempted assassination during a campaign rally on July 13th, five people were put on leave as disciplinary action. This includes a special agent in charge of the Pittsburgh field office, three other officials from the Pittsburgh office, and one agent within Donald Trump's detail. Congressman Mike Kelly, Republican of Pennsylvania, whose district includes Butler, is the task force chair. The ranking Democrat is Jason Crow from Colorado. Here's part of the news conference in Butler, starting with Congressman Kelly. The most important thing is to recognize is we are U.S. representatives, not Democrats, not Republicans, but both searching for the answers and reassuring the American people that we can work together and we can get the right answers so this doesn't happen again. Uh, I think for Jason and I, it was an easy it was an easy thing to get on board with because we're we're more team members than quarterbacking things but i, I got to tell you uh we're glad to be here uh and i would like all all our colleagues that are with us it's fantastic to have you all here the idea that they can come to this exact site to see what happened is is incredibly important i'm just going to open up for a few questions we are on a, on a pretty busy schedule because we have a lot of other stuff that we're going to be talking to local law enforcement is waiting to talk to us so as quickly as we can we'll take some questions thomas Cooks had a clear line of sight when you guys were all up on that agr roof just how stunned were you that there were i'm told zero obstacles to the stage can someone speak to that well, I, only because I was here much earlier and I saw all this go on. Um, but I think when you talk to the members of this committee who actually have done that in military service, they look at it and they look at the measuring of distances and they said, how could this not have been prevented? And the, the, the burning question is always going to be with me. There was knowledge ahead of time that there was a person of suspicion on that roof and armed. The key was get the former president of the United States off the podium, then there's nothing that has to take place. Mr. Comprator will be alive today, the two men that were wounded, the president, and also, not only did we lose Mr. Comprator that day, the Brooks the family lost their son. Um, before Congress, I was an Army Ranger. I served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you know, one of the, the fundamental uh, principles you operate is you always secure the high ground or you have eyes on the high ground. So I, I definitely took note today that there were a lot of lines of sight that appear to have been unsecured that day that didn't have on, uh, eyes on or, or that weren't secured. And certainly uh, at this point, a lot more questions than answers. Can you share which federal agencies you all have communicated with thus far? And two, some other lawmakers involved in separate probes accuse the FBI Secret Service of stonewalling. Can you say whether you all have experienced that thus far? No, I, I think we've asked for information, right? And we've got partial information back. The whole effort for this task force is to make sure we get all the answers to the questions we asked and, and be able to go forward from there. Uh, I think we've got to be very careful uh, because there's reports out there about five members of the Secret Service have been uh, been put on leave or whatever the term is they want to use and right away the question comes up well what did what do we know that we didn't re, we didn't react to i just think that really at this point uh, and i think whenever uh, jason and i first talked the most important thing that we can get out there is not get it out quickly but get it out accurately so the american people can say okay that makes sense when you do day after day after day of a different opinion i think that's what adds to then the idea they're hiding something they're stonewalling whatever we've made requests uh, the staff in D.C., right, they are, they're, doing, they're going through all this. They're getting answers for us. We did have a, a, a phone conversation last week with the FBI, and I think we're all longing for the time that we can be together, question those people on those different committee, or, uh, uh, committees. Uh, what was it that you were doing that day? And let's follow up on that. I just think getting to the truth is a slow process. And for us, none of us are looking at it as we have to get a quick answer. We're looking at we have to get the right answer. Uh, I just know with his background, everything they do is planned as, as a special ops guy. Everything is planned. It just doesn't happen. So I think that's what we're relying on. We've got really good people looking for the truth. So, uh, Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, you know, our staff is in regular communication with all of the federal agencies involved. We've received several briefings, uh, one uh, to the members or including the members just last week. Uh, with the FBI, including a staff level briefing to the Secret Service from the Secret Service as well. Uh, we have sent one letter, the uh, chairman and I have sent one letter assuming jurisdiction from all other committees uh, and directing any further productions of information to the task force, which according to the legislation that was passed last month, uh, we are the we are the sole uh, task force of jurisdiction for the House of Representatives for this investigation, and we are proceeding that way. Uh, and um, you know, with respect to any other 
uh, investigations. The, the FBI is conducting a criminal investigation. Uh, there are inspector general investigations that every agency conducts as a matter of course. Uh, and uh, you know, other we, we are aware of other members conducting reviews. But again, this is the committee or this is the task force that the House of Representatives has empowered uh, with subpoena power, with a full investigative authority to conduct the uh, the review. Congressman Jason Crow, Democrat from Colorado, ranking member on the task force on the attempted assassination of Donald J. Trump. At a news conference in Butler, Pennsylvania, you also heard from the committee chair, Mike Kelly, Republican of Pennsylvania, who whose district includes Butler. Other Republicans on the task force are Mark Green of Tennessee, David Joyce of Ohio, Laurel Lee of Florida, Michael Waltz of Florida, Clay Higgins of Louisiana, and Pat Fallon of Texas, another Democratic members of the committee, Luke Correa of California, Madeline Dean of Pennsylvania, Chrissy Houlihan of Pennsylvania, Glenn Ivey of Maryland, and Jared Moskowitz of Florida. A group of House Republicans led by Corey Mills of Florida and Eli Crane of Arizona held a forum today in Washington on what they say is an independent investigation into the assassination attempt of Donald Trump. Congressman Mills explained their purpose. As the United States Congressman for Florida 7th District, I had conducted at least a thousand of these advances in my lifetime with regards to the State Department and others. And I can tell you, having worked on a counter sniper team, having worked on an advanced team, that there are critical failures that need to be identified so that the American people can understand the transparency of it, but also to raise the questions and awarenesses of why. That is the intent of this entire hearing, is to get to the why get to those who are responsible, bearing in mind responsibility and accountability are two very different things. This is not an I'm sorry, I'll resign, I'm finished. This is a get accountability to pursue either purposeful intent or criminal gross negligence. The questions that we have to ask is why was a venue such as the one selected not having the adequate security? Why was the higher vantage points not covered? Why was there not a either comparable or compatible communication system or a joint operations center established? Where was the security plan, the comms plan, the data range cards? Where was the actual overwatch? Where was the ground teams as far as their rates of instruction? And what was the tactical techniques and procedures that were to be utilized that would identify and mitigate all the existing threats? Congressman Corey Mills, Republican from Florida at today's forum held by five House Republicans at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. One of the witnesses they invited was Dan Bongino, podcast host and former U.S. Secret Service agent. Here he's questioned by Congressman Eli Crane, Republican from Arizona. Mr. Bongino, I want to turn to you real quick. As somebody with a lot of experience in the Secret Service, is it correct, sir, that you at this point have members of the Secret Service whistleblowing and calling you right now to talk to you about the culture of the Secret Service? There were so many. Um, it's um, it's getting to the point now where I thank them and, and say, I, but I've already heard that from 10 other guys. Um, and I bring that up because none of these problems are new. Anybody telling you that is lying directly to your face, and you better hope they're not under oath. Anyone is suggesting in a congressional hearing or elsewhere um, that, that these problems are new, the personnel problems, the logistics problems, the manpower problems, the technology problems. I just told you a sad running joke in the service when I was there. I'm gone since 2011. It, it, last time I checked, it's 2024. It was yesterday's technology tomorrow. And, and, and other, other things here that are inexcusable that have been brought up before, uh, like uh, uh, Ben and, and, uh, and Eric just brought up. The communication failures are basic. This isn't like the Secret Service million dollar radio system that uses uh, NSA level encryption magically broke down that day. They literally handed them a radio they didn't take. This is why when Congressman Mills says, you know, borderline criminal negligence, you should take that seriously. What could possibly, possibly be your excuse to say, you know what? I don't really need to communicate with the law enforcement guys out there on the scene. We asked, asked to, they had no obligation to be there. It's a secret services job to protect the president. Out of the a courtesy, they showed up. And you don't even have the respect of these local law enforcement people, respect for them to take the radio. 
I mean, where was the CP, the command post? There's, the way this works, so everybody understands, or it's supposed to and didn't that day, for reasons still unexplained outside of, again, obscene negligence, any trip for a high-level protectee, you're supposed to have a command post that runs the whole trip at the airport or whatever. They'll communicate with everyone. But those individual sites, like in Butler County, have security rooms themselves, which are kind of mini CPs at each site. Where was it? According to what, what Ben said before and from what I've heard, it was either not there or the, the locals were running it, offered communications, and the Secret Service, whose job it was that day to protect President Trump, said, eh, we're going to pass on the comms. I, I, really, you described it as catastrophic. I, I, he's 100% correct. Eric knows exactly what he's talking about. Just apocalyptic failure. Dan Bongino, podcast host and former U.S. Secret Service agent, questioned by Congressman Eli Crane, Republican from Arizona, at today's forum in Washington, led by a group of House Republicans on the assassination attempt of Donald Trump, what they're calling an independent investigation. A New York Post article today with the headline, Why would-be Trump assassin Thomas Crooks remains an infuriating enigma weeks after shooting? Article reads in part, When federal authorities raided his family's modest home in the wake of the shooting, agents seized hardware, including his laptop, two cell phones, and multiple hard drives and flash drives. The large amount of data recovered, around four and a half terabytes, is a potential technological treasure trove for forensics teams. But authorities said getting definitive answers has been slow going due to the sheer volume of information to sift through. However, it's clear from congressional hearings and the details that have emerged from FBI briefings with lawmakers that investigators still have no satisfying answers for why crooks targeted Trump. That from the New York Post. And from AP, the campaigns of Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump are arguing in advance of their high-stakes September 10th debate over whether microphones should be muted except for the candidate whose turn it is to speak. Donald Trump on Sunday night raised the possibility that he might not show up on ABC, posting on his Truth Social Network that he had watched the network Sunday shows with a so-called panel of Trump haters and posited, why would I do the debate against Kamala Harris on that network? And urging followers to stay tuned. Reporting from Associated Press, Donald Trump spoke about this when he took questions from reporters in Arlington, Virginia, at a Vietnamese restaurant. He was campaigning for U.S. Senate nominee Hung Kao. I think ABC is a disgrace. I think having Donna Brazil sitting on that panel, and she's the one that gave the answers and the questions to Hillary Clinton before a debate. Uh, I think ABC is really should be shut out. Uh, I'd much rather do it on NBC. I'd much rather do it on CBS, frankly. I think CBS is very unfair, but the best of the group. And certainly I'd do it on Fox. I'd even do it on CNN. I thought CNN treated us very fairly the last time. I think Jake Tapper was very fair and Dana Bash was very fair. But when I watch this interview of Tom Cotton, fortunately, he's a total pro. He knows what he's doing. And then when I watch the roundtable after that, I said, the hostility is crazy. So uh, we're thinking about it. We're thinking about it. They also want to change the rules. You know, the deal was we keep the same rules. Now, all of a sudden, they want to make a change in the rules because she can't answer questions. Why doesn't she do a couple of uh, question answers? Why doesn't she do something like I'm doing right now? She can't talk. We can't have another dummy as a president, okay? We cannot have a dummy. And the people from Vietnam agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Trump, would, would you want the microphones muted in the debate whenever you're not speaking? We agreed to the same rules. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. I'd rather have it probably on. But the agreement was that it would be the same as it was last time. In that case, it was muted. Uh, I didn't like it the last time, but it worked out fine. I mean, ask Biden how it worked out. It was fine. And I think it should be the same. We agreed to the same rules. Same rules and same specifications. And I think that's probably what it should be. But they're trying to change it. The truth is they're trying to get out of it because she doesn't want to debate. She's not a good debater. She's not a smart person. She doesn't want to debate. Donald Trump, former president and Republican presidential nominee for this November's election, today in Arlington, Virginia, at a Vietnamese restaurant where he was standing beside the U.S. Senate Republican nominee, Hung Kao. Michael Tyler, 
Harris Waltz, campaign communications director, said on MSNBC why Vice President Kamala Harris, Democratic presidential nominee, prefers the live microphones at the debate. Is this an issue that is going to make the debate, you know, is this a make it or break it on this debate? No, it shouldn't be because, again, Donald Trump, again, today himself said it doesn't matter to him that he's comfortable with live microphones throughout the debate. And does it uh, matter to the, to the Harris debate? Does the Harris campaign matter if it's open or not? I mean, is that enough? Yeah, to that is absolutely stop. That is absolutely our preference. That is absolutely our preference okay. in this campaign to have live microphones so that the American people can see both candidates for who they are uh, and hear everything that comes out of their mouths. Donald Trump will be on the, that debate stage and he will talk about his plans to ban abortion. He'll interject, he'll rant, he'll rave, he'll air his own. No, I got it. I got it. But I'm just and the American people. Deserve I'm just to wondering. See that. I got it. But it just seems like it's like such a minor point to be canceling or not uh, a debate. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad that you cleared that one up. Uh, let's see, you know, if there's any response by by the Trump campaign. Uh, but meanwhile, yeah, I want to ask you about Trump. Trump, uh, has, Trump has yeah. made his response and he he agrees with our position. So we look forward to the debate on September 10th with live mics between the two candidates. That's what the American people deserve to see. And apparently that's what they will see. Michael Tyler, a campaign communications director for Harris Waltz today on MSNBC. Donald Trump is in Detroit today and plans to hold campaign events in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania this week. Vice President Kamala Harris and the Democratic running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, plan a bus tour of southern Georgia this week, followed by a rally held by Kamala Harris in Savannah, Georgia. Elaine Kmark, Democratic National Committee Rules and Bylaws Committee member, took part today in a Brookings Institution virtual discussion about the presidential campaign and what came out of last week's Democratic National Convention. The moderator, Doyle McManus, Washington columnist for the Los Angeles Times, asked her about a Republican criticism of the nominee. We don't have an official Republican on this panel, so let me channel what I thought was one of the most interesting Republican critiques we saw last week, and it came from the estimable Peggy Noonan of the Wall Street Journal. And it was this. Here's what Peggy wrote. Uh, Harris's real weak point is policy. She will be perceived by many voters as farther to the left than they want to go. One of the reasons Democrats had such unity is that the progressives won a struggle in the party. Uh, that's where the rising power in the party is. And Ms. Ms. Harris is of and from that rising power. Does Peggy Noonan have a point? Is, uh, is the Harris ticket's vulnerability, uh, the one that uh, Mr. Trump is already playing on, calling them a bunch of dangerous leftist radicals? Let, let, me, let me take that on to begin with. Um, I think that what needs to be seen here is the, the full context, that there has been somewhat of a shift um, to the left in the Democratic Party, certainly since the era when Bill Galston and I were hammering the Democratic Party to, to not be too far to the left because they kept losing elections. But that's because the whole country has gone there. So, for instance, I can remember so clearly the 1992 Clinton campaign. He gave one event on um, gay rights, and it was carefully timed to be at 1130 at night. Because back then, there was no Internet stuff, and so we uh, had to wait for filing deadlines for papers, et cetera. And it essentially went unnoticed. And that's that's not at all the case today. The other thing that's happened in this period of time is that the Republican Party has simply gone off the rails. And that's where I think Pe that's what I think Peggy misses is that. And, and this is why Vance, by the way, is so unpopular. It turns out that Vance's cat lady's comment not only was offensive in and of itself, but it opened up an entire exploration of this far right wing of the Republican Party that basically believes that women ought to have children. It has it has feelings of the handmaid's tale. You know, that Margaret Atwood novel that was such a popular um, television show where women's bodies were subjected to the state for the purpose of of child rearing. I mean, it, it's it's creepy stuff. It's just really creepy stuff. And I think that what's really happened is not so much that the Democrats have moved a little bit to the left, but the country has. It's a much more open 
country, women's rights are are much more taken for granted. And there's this b- bunch of Republicans out there wanting to take us back, which is why that slogan from the convention was so important. That refers, make no doubt about it, that refers to abortion, but more largely to women's rights, women's place in society, etc. cetera. And uh, that is incredibly powerful. And that's where they're in trouble. That's really where they're in trouble. Elaine K. Mark, Democratic National Committee Rules and Bylaws Committee member at a Brookings Institution virtual discussion about the presidential campaign. You also heard from the moderator Doyle McManus from the L.A. Times. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi, I'm Susan Swain. Campaign 2024 has evolved in some unexpected ways. And from now until Election Day, C-SPAN promises you unfiltered coverage of the candidates as they battle to win the White House and Congress. You may not know that C-SPAN is a private company that operates without a dime of government money. And like many media organizations, we've been impacted by cord cutting. This summer, we are asking for you to help support our unbiased political coverage with a donation. Here's the good news. 100% of your contribution, large or small, directly supports C-SPAN operations. And best of all, an anonymous donor has pledged to match your donation dollar for dollar. You can find out more at cspan.org backslash donate. Help ensure that C-SPAN's unique, long-form coverage of politics is here to stay. Visit cspan.org backslash donate. Thank you for watching and thanks so much for your support. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you find your podcasts and on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app. Story from Reuters, Israeli officials and media reacted with satisfaction on Monday after a long-expected missile attack by the Iranian-backed Hezbollah movement appeared to have been largely thwarted by preemptive Israeli strikes in southern Lebanon. Both Hezbollah and Israel seem content to let Sunday's attack in retaliation for the killing of a senior Hezbollah commander in Beirut last month count as settled for the moment. And a story from CNN, negotiators working to strike a deal for a ceasefire in Gaza and the release of Israeli hostages made progress over the weekend, according to a senior U.S. official familiar with the talks in Cairo, where mediators discussed final details of a potential agreement, including the names of prisoners that would be exchanged as part of the pact. Those stories from CNN and from Reuters. The White House Strategic Communications Advisor, John Kirby, spoke about all this during a virtual audio news conference. I just wanted to um, ask just about the ongoing talks in Cairo, um, just how they were working, who's leading these working level talks, how long are they expected to last, And can you offer any detail on the broad areas these technical uh, talks will be focused on? And then secondly, just with over the weekend um, with the fighting between Israel and Hezbollah, has that had any impact on the talks? And is there broadly concern that the window for completing these negotiations um, will eventually or will soon close? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Amr. Um, So the, uh, the working groups are meeting now in Cairo. Uh, Brett McGurk uh, stayed in Cairo uh, an extra day to get him kicked off, and he's there now. Um, uh, but he'll he'll probably uh, depart relatively soon and and leave the the the, the discussion and the work uh, to uh, the working group members. I don't have uh, a list of names of all the the, the people that are going to be represented there, but all parties will be represented, including Hamas, in those working group discussions. And as for how long they'll take. Um, I think that remains to be seen. We expect that these working group discussions will at least take place over the next few days. Uh, but uh, whether it goes longer or, you know, could end sooner, uh, I think really uh, is going to be up uh, uh, to those in the room and and uh, what they're able to accomplish. And then that gets to your other question about, well, what are they working on? Um, I, I think it's safe to say that um, that the issues they're going to be talking about um are of a much more detailed specific nature than we've um you know than we've uh, typically been able to to talk about um for instance um and i want to be careful obviously but for instance uh, one issue uh, that will be for the working groups to 
uh, to flesh out is the exchange of hostages and prisoners uh, that Israel's holding. Um, what that exchange looks like, how many, um, uh, you know, some of the some of the details of exactly who will be released on either side. Uh, and at what pace, those kinds of things. That's a good example of some of the things that they're trying to flesh out now. I think it's best if I don't go into more detail than that, though, right now. Um, and on the uh, attacks over the weekend, um, no, there was not uh, an impact on the, the talks in, in Cairo. Uh, and we're certainly glad to see that. Obviously, as I said earlier, the, the the working groups are now meeting and, and talking. And so uh, there continues to be progress. And um, our team on the ground continues to describe the talks as constructive. So despite the rocket and drone attack by Hezbollah over the course of the weekend, which uh, Israel did uh, 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 a terrific job defending against, it has not affected the actual work on the ground uh, by the by the teams trying to get this ceasefire deal in place. And then so your, your other question about whether the window is closing or not, look, we've had a sense of urgency about this since the get go. Um, and the president announced this uh, this proposal way back in, in late May. And here we are, you and me talking in uh, late August. Um, we would have obviously preferred to see this ceasefire in place months ago, um, right after the, the president uh, laid forward that pr proposal that was uh, that originated in uh, in Israel. And so here we are, um, we're still having these talks. I mean, we, we've we never let go of that sense of urgency. We wanna get it done as soon as possible. Um, and uh, uh, I think we're all watching what's going on in the region writ large, uh, very, very closely monitoring the situation. Um, don't wanna see the, uh, uh, an all out war and we're doing everything we can to try to prevent that as you probably heard from the Pentagon, you know, we're, we're maintaining a, a pretty robust force posture there to be able to defend ourselves and defend Israel should it come to that. Hopefully it won't, but uh, we want to get this ceasefire deal as, as soon as possible. So that we we've ha haven't let our, uh, we haven't let uh, our interest in doing that wane. We haven't taken our foot off the gas. Uh, the, the same sense of urgency exists now as it did months ago. John Kirby is White House Strategic Communications Advisor in a virtual audio news conference, and AFP writes the U.S. assesses there is still a threat of a new attack on Israel by Iran or its proxies, the Pentagon said Monday after Lebanon's Hezbollah launched a rocket and drone barrage over the weekend. Pentagon spokesman Major General Pat Ryder told journalists, we continue to assess that there is a threat of attack and we remain well postured to be able to support Israel's defense as well as to protect our forces should they be attacked. Another Reuters story, United Nations aid operations in Gaza ground to a halt on Monday after Israel issued new evacuation orders on Sunday in the central Gaza Strip, where the U.N. Operations Center was located, said a senior U.N. official. And Sam Rose, senior deputy field director for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, also known as UNRWA, gave more information during a news conference with reporters at the United Nations in New York City. Sam Rose joined remotely. Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Um, thanks so much for doing this briefing for us. We really appreciate it. Um, We've just heard uh, from a senior UN official who said that given the, the evacuation order that was made yesterday in the area where the UN Central Command for all aid operations is, has been made, that as of today, basically all UN humanitarian operations have ground to a halt because conditions just don't allow for them to take place. What can you tell us about that and what are you how might this affect the upcoming polio vac vaccination uh, thank you no thanks for the question look indeed yeah it was about this time yesterday evacuation orders were, were issued there have been a slew of them over august i think 13 or 15 in in august to date the ones uh last night affected a block of gaza in which a, a, a number of un international guest houses were, were, were situated. So a number of UN staff on the move, their buildings are evacuated. We're in the UNRWA guest house here and we've, we're accommodating a, a number of, of international staff. Others had to spend the night in, in one of our warehouses down 
in, in Khan Yunis. I mean, what, what I can say is that, that the humanitarian operations have been incredibly squeezed. We're getting very little aid supply in through, through Kerem Shalom. We estimate that a million people who we plan to assist with, with food aid in, in August will go without. But look, for, for UNRWA, we, we deliver our services directly through, uh, through our, our, our workforce of, of, of 5,000 staff who are working on, on any given day. Our health services continue across eight or nine primary health care centers and over 90 health points that are operating in and around schools that have turned into shelters where literally hundreds of thousands of people are, 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 are seeking shelter. Those services are, are continuing, but indeed the space and the ability of the UN system, of the humanitarian system to operate in Gaza is becoming increasingly difficult, is becoming increasingly constrained at a time when we need to throw all resources at this to, uh, to, to deal with the issues that we're facing. Sam Rose is Senior Deputy Field Director for UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East. During a news conference today, he joined remotely to reporters at the UN in New York City. Returning to the Reuters article, the evacuation order came as the UN prepares to begin on Saturday a campaign to vaccinate an estimated 640,000 children in Gaza where the World Health Organization said a 10-month-old baby had been paralyzed by the type 2 polio virus, the first such case in the territory in 25 years. Kyiv Independent writes that Russia has launched the largest attack on Ukraine since the beginning of the full-scale invasion in 2022. Ukraine's Air Force reported on August 26th. Seven people were killed and 47 were injured, according to the State Emergency Service. Russian forces carry out an attack targeting 15 Oblasts, according to the prime minister. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky posting on X, each of these strikes repeatedly reminds us of the critical need for long-range capabilities to give our defense forces sufficient long-range weapons to destroy the terrorists precisely at the locations from which they launch their attacks. From Bloomberg, China will bring up issues related to Taiwan and, quote, arbitrary measures like tariffs. When U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan visits this week, a trip aimed at maintaining dialogue between the geopolitical rivals. The official Xinhua News Agency reported Sunday, citing a foreign ministry official, the Chinese side will focus on raising serious concerns, articulating its position, and laying out serious demands on issues related to the Taiwan question, the right to development, and China's strategic security. That was from Bloomberg. Jake Sullivan was in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, meeting with Canadian government officials on Sunday before he left for China. And during a news conference, he was asked about tariffs. Hello, I'm Tonda McCharles with the Toronto Star. Um, Three months after the U.S. uh, imposed tariffs, hiked tariffs on Chinese EV imports, um, Canada still has yet to act, uh, has not yet revealed its plan. And I'm wondering what your message is to the Canadian government vis-a-vis your national security concerns around this vital industry. And are they mainly economic or are they centered on the software in these vehicles? Or can you elaborate as you head to China yourself tomorrow, what your message to Canada is and should the two countries be presenting a united front? Canada ultimately will determine its own trade policy, and that's uh, for the prime minister and the government to make determinations on. It's not for the for the U.S. to try to, to dictate. Of course, we will talk behind closed doors about our experience and what we see. And what we see is really two distinct challenges. One to do with overcapacity, uh, which we have talked about quite openly. The view that massive subsidies going into the Chinese electric vehicle industry uh, have eliminated a level playing field. And so part of the economic response the U.S. has taken is responding to that. And then there are issues associated with data security, with critical infrastructure, and with the underlying uh, questions of national security associated with connected vehicles, uh, electric vehicles. And so that has also motivated steps that we have taken on policy grounds uh, through presidential action. So I'll be talking about all of that with my Chinese counterparts when I see them in Beijing. We'll discuss this here as well. And I will also point out, uh, standing here before you, that the European Union has taken action on this front. 
And the G7 has spoken broadly about this set of issues, about overcapacity and about the national security challenges associated with certain kinds of supply chain issues and trade issues. And Canada will make its own determinations. But the U.S. does believe that a, a united front, a coordinated approach on these issues benefits all of us. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, on Sunday, meeting with Canadian government officials before he headed off to China. Back in May, President Biden imposed new tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, advanced batteries, solar cells, steel, aluminum, and medical equipment. Today, the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made an announcement about tariffs on EVs and steel from China imported to Canada. Companies around the world are taking an interest in investing in Canada to make things in Canada more than just about any other country. So today, we're taking yet another step to ensure that Canada is the country of choice to make the things that will drive the new 21st century green economy. We're listening to automakers. We're listening to workers. Shortly, we will be introducing a 100% tariff on Chinese-made electric vehicles and a 25% tariff on Chinese steel and aluminum. See, because of our government's choices and the hard work of hundreds of thousands of Canadian auto workers, we are transforming Canada's automotive sector to be a global leader in building the vehicles of tomorrow. But actors like China have chosen to give themselves an unfair advantage in the global marketplace, compromising the security of our critical critical industries and displacing dedicated Canadian autos and metal workers. So we're taking action to address that. We actually spent some time talking about that and many other geopolitical issues last night with Jake Sullivan, the U.S. National Security Advisor. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at a news conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia. An article from Financial Post reads, For now, Chinese automakers do not have a significant presence in Canada, but its share of EV imports grew markedly last year. In 2023, the value of Chinese-made EVs grew to $2.2 billion, up from $84 million in 2022. And meanwhile, China's BYD Company Limited has been meeting with federal government officials about selling its vehicles here. That was from Financial Post. And on Wall Street, the Dow up 65, Nasdaq down 152, S&P down 17. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word, and you'll get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.